in, everyone, to this week's Five Aside episode, a very special edition of the Five Aside, where we are doing it for the culture, specifically supporter culture. This will be one of four episodes where we are going to be diving into the history of the beautiful game and those that support it. The supporters will also be featuring each of our six supporter groups and our newly formed uh, supporter group council, The Gulch. And to help us with this endeavor, we are joined by a woman who claims she is not the originator of all things glitter, but quite clearly is. It's Jennifer Taylor. Hello, Jennifer. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> we are also very fortunate, very, very fortunate to be joined by two members of the Gulch, Curtis Jones and Abby Schiffman. Hello, Abby. Hello, Curtis. Hello. It's Jenkins. It's Curtis Jenkins. Oh, what did I say? You said did Jones? Curtis Jones? Jones? Why did I say Jones? It's Jenkins. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. Why did I, I say that? This for the rest of time. Well, this is off to a sterling start. Anyhow, we are joined by Curtis Jenkins and Abby Sheffman. Hello to both of you. Thank you for giving your time tonight. We really appreciate you uh, joining in on this thing. It's an important thing to do. It's a cool thing to do to show, um, you know, shine a little spotlight on all things Atlanta uh, United supporter culture. Let's dive into a little bit of the history of the beautiful game and the people that support it. So the word soccer actually has its roots in 1880s England. That's right, y'all. You came up with the word, not us. It was later adopted it in the U.S. It is called soccer. It is called soccer. And we didn't come up with that name. Y'all nope. coined it. <laughs> Uh, by 1910, the New York Times was regularly referring to soccer fans. The rise of soccer as a spectator sport was really propelled by the working class and immigrant workers. It is a working class uh, game at, at heart. Interest in the sport in the U.S. picked up after the U.S. national team beat England in a group stage in the 1950 World Cup. Was that the last time that we actually did beat England in any sort of international... I I consider our two previous draws wins. Totally fair. With England. With England. <laughs> I'm totally fair. It. <laughs> it was England's debut at the World Cup. And they, at the time, and let's be honest, probably still do, consider themselves the kings of football. In 1951, Life magazine published The Great Spectator Sport uh, about British football. They wrote, crowds are football's most overwhelming feature. And for me, I think when it comes to soccer, it is the thing that kind of sets itself apart from other sports that are, that are great and that have fans and people that are passionate about it. But it's not the same as fans of baseball or hockey or um, curling or whatever else you got out there. It's just different. So. In the, oh, what were we saying? Go ahead. I was just going to say that, you know, it, it, it is, it, you know, having been a long, you know, a fan of a lot of different sports and a lot of different sporting events, like th there is mm. no experience like going to a live soccer match because it is a fully immersive event. And I don't think it matters where you sit, whether you're in a supporter section like, that's designated to do all of that or, you know, three quarters of the way around the building or all the way up at the top of the 300s. You can't help during certain moments of the match, like when a when a when a building is really buzzing, like being a part of that whole vibe and like and getting into it. And I've never, I mean, I've been in some loud stadiums before, and I've just still to this day never seen anything like it gets, you know, at a professional soccer match. Abby Curtis, what do you think? Is it different in, in, from your points of view too than than other sports that you've maybe been involved with or enjoy? I think the closest I've seen is. NCAA basketball at the right schools and NCAA football at the right schools, but not as a rule. Mm. So uh, Cameron Indoor gets loud and there's no air conditioning and nobody cares. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a reason the Premier League plays all their games when they come here for their tours, mostly at college football stadiums like Good the Horse Street and the Big House because they can hold 100,000 people that's, and they get loud. True. And I mean, to think about the number of people who get drunk and loud on a November night in Ohio at a F, at a OSU game, there has to be something there. I mean, like I said, it's not everywhere. You're not seeing that where I went to college, where my humble school of 3,500 
played at the local high school stadium for three years I was there. Yeah. It's it's an interesting point you bring up, bring up not to derail us too much, which I never do. Um, Jennifer, the responsibility is on you to move this thing forward. But when you were talking about how fanatical um, college sports are and, and, and fans of college sports, I'm wondering if that might be why Atlanta United has kind of taken off the way that it has in the support that it's gotten. A lot of people think thought soccer wouldn't work in the South um, because of college, because it is such an NCAA, you know, it's a college thing, college football Saturday. Maybe there's some similarities there in terms of the, the passion uh, for, for each. And I don't think they realized how many people in Atlanta are from elsewhere. So for those of us that didn't grow up here and we moved here from areas that might have had soccer mm. before we moved here, I mean, I was ecstatic when we were getting a team. Well, 140 years ago, before uh, college sports was what it, what it is today, in the 1880s, football really became popular in Britain. Social changes at the time made it possible for working people to enjoy new pastimes. But the term football fans didn't really take hold until the beginning of around the 20th century. The word originates from America, actually, and is a shortened form of the word fanatic, used to describe baseball enthusiasts at the time. Um, an Irish-born manager, Ted Sullivan, of the then 1884 St. Louis Maroons, claimed that he invented the term. The mm, fact-checking on that's a little dubious, but let's say we'll just give him credit for sake of discussion. He wrote that after listening to a baseball board just kind of reeling off facts and statistics and being told he's a fanatic, he said, I'll just abbreviate that word and I'll call him a fan. And now we have fans. Um, supporter groups around the world have different names. In Latin America, there's Barra Bravas, translated literally to fierce group. Firms, uh, derived from British slang for a criminal gang in the UK and Scotland. Uh, Torchitas literally supporters in Portuguese, in Brazil, uh, and then uh, Curva, coming from the curve of the stadiums in Italy. And then there's Ultras, which are just about everywhere, including San Jose. What's up, San Jose Ultras? Uh, <laughs> shirts off, shirts off. But the very first organized football supporters were the uh, Hinchadas of Uruguay, which is sort of fitting, considering Uruguay won the very first World Cup in 1930. Uh, the equipment manager for Club Nacional, Prudencio Miguel Reyes. Reyes. Me if I'm wrong, Reyes. That sounds right. Uh, who's, that sounds good. I'm doing okay. Uh, who's yeah, primary you're doing response? With all these very weird foreign languages, we're asking you to spit out. Yeah, here. I'm. I'm going all over the world tonight. Um, his primary responsibility was to inflate the balls. He quickly became the loudest Nacional supporter from the sidelines, encouraging and organizing fans to chant for their team. He became known as El Hincha, stemming from the Spanish verb for inflate. Literally. Um, Reyes literally changed the Spanish dictionary as you can look it up now. Uh, Google it if you think I'm lying. Hincha is now the term used for any football fan in the Spanish dictionary. Kind of cool little fact. Learned a lot in doing our, our research for this. Um, I am learning so much. We learned a ton too. It's been great. Um, Source the, the Athletic. Urban Pitch, Wikipedia, always reliable. Um, <laughs> the, Guardian. Times, the Guardian. The um, Guardian. A lot of di different places. Um, there was some stadium not... guru website that had a whole bunch of fun stuff on there, but he like rates all the stadiums and stuff. Mm. And yeah, so lots of different, lots of different places from uh, you know where you know where all this you know stuff can be found out. Because I mean, we all just kind of showed up, but like someone had to show up yeah, before we did. Right. That's right. Um, I did not use chat GPT for any of this. AI was not involved in any of this. I am staunchly against AI as a Y'all can't, can't see you, this on man. the, uh, on the uh, recording, but Curtis looks very impressed that no chat GPT was involved here. It wasn't really until the post-war quote unquote golden age emerged the image of the, the traditional football fan, you know, wearing scarves, chanting, creating TIFO displays, all the things we associate with a supporter these days. So uh, how do you recognize a supporter when you see one? I think, you know, 
the iconic thing that comes to mind is the scarf. You know, Curtis keeps me broke all on a year round basis because he keeps <laughs> dropping these ridiculously dope scarf designs. And, oh my God. Now, he's, now all. he's just showing off his wall of awesome. And that's just not even playing fair. Um, and again, you listening audience can't see, but you know, Ag- Abby is in her, uh, schwa- her legendary swag cave. Um, and it's and, impressive. And, you know, it's yeah, but I mean the scarves are so cool because they're so unique, they're so different, they're so collectible. Um, you know, you, you, people use them for all sorts of stuff to memorialize a specific match, to identify with you know a di- you know one team or another team, and because soccer's weird and convoluted and has an insane amount of side tournaments and national teams and first divisions and whatever. You know, if, if you're somebody who wants to collect just tournament scarves. Give yourself a year and you'll have 45 different scarves from 45 <laughs> different random teams, matches, whatever that, that you've played in. But, but that's kind of the beauty of it. There are so many ways and opportunities to support the sport, the game that you love. At, at the smallest level up to a national team, Argentina winning a World Cup and everything in between. So, Abby and Curtis, are you familiar with how the whole phenomenon of the scarf came about? I am not. Please no. so, enlighten us. It's, Please it's, enlighten it's us. Super pra- it's super practical. Uh, England is dark and cold and rainy, and they play <laughs> soccer in the winter. And everybody wore black Bless their hearts. Everybody wore black coats. So if you were wearing any sort of team color badge or pin or whatever, nobody could see it in the winter during most of the season because it was freaking cold out there. Um, so... Basically, you had some uh, mothers and grandmothers that started knitting scarves in stripy team colors. They were actually called granny scarves. And um, God, I hate saying this, but the first documented appearance of these things was at an Arsenal match in the late 20s. And yeah, they were just basically handmade knitted scarves in the team colors so that the team colors would show up against the, the the black coats. Uh, and then, but not, you know, in the 1960s with, um, the boom of color photography, uh, that is when pictures of seas of fans raising their scarves above their high, that the scarf really became more of a vital part of the atmosphere that you find today in stadiums. Um, Mm. so it wasn't just a convenient way to display your team colors, but it was also showing your personal support to the players and maybe heckling the opposition fans and, you know, showing solidarity to the team you support. And then, with the advent of major league soccer in 94 um the the supporter groups emerged alongside the founding clubs and because they wanted to create a similar style and ambiance to the european atmosphere the scarf then pretty much entered the american lexicon of 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 fandom um mm-hmm. and you know the the it's you know a lot of it has to do with tv coverage and people wanting everything to show up better on TV. And it was also a way to differentiate, like how much, you know, you like, you know, how much uh, different differentiate the fan experience because it wasn't really a thing in any other sports. And now if you look at like hot, a lot of hockey teams are making, uh, are making scarves football, like, like the scarf has become. It, it, it's interesting how basically us fans, us supporters created an industry <laughs> essentially of we're the ones buying all this stuff, but we're the, all the ones that wanted it made. And grandma couldn't keep up in England with her little hands, bless her heart, knitting a million miles an hour. We created an entire industry just out of our crazy love for the game and for the teams and for the players that we all support all around the world. It's kind of wild. I mean, quite frankly, grandma should have started an LLC, outsourced, <laughs> oh, and my found Lord. a way to make it work because all I know is I need grandma to hustle. <laughs> I need her to be built different. I need her to be making, pumping those scarves out and getting everybody, getting everybody's money. <laughs> so, so Curtis, you know, when if you're you have a grandma about- out there that's looking for, you know, post-retirement, uh, please go uh, talk to Curtis. He has, yep. some, he's got some ideas for you. Yes. So, so Curtis and Abby, I have a question for you. When it's all over for you, what is the one scarf that you take with you? What's what's the one? What's the what's the one in your collection? Atlanta United Championship winning yep. the MLS Cup. The the locker room one, or like the split, or 
Not the uh, split. Whichever Not one split. was on the trophy. <laughs> I'm looking being, behind me because I've got them all. Whichever one was on the trophy that was being twerked over. <laughs> that one, specifically. Ask glitter and all. <laughs> Curtis, Let's which one is it for you? If it's me, it's the uh, rumored Fiddle Mob scarf that we had an entire run made. They were printed incorrectly, and we were like, we cannot put these out. So they shipped us a whole new shipment, and we had to find a place to lay off 1,500 scarves. One turned up one day, and no one knew what it was. And we were like, just stay quiet. No one knows what it is. It turned up randomly at a Goodwill downtown. Oh my no, God, you can, you can make money off of those. Wait a minute, what? Wait, did you yeah. say footle? Footle. Footle, yeah. there must be L instead of an I. They put an L instead of an I. On That's 15 incredible. scarves. It was the Fe- member scarf for like 2019. That's incredible. I did not know about this. How did I not know about this? My mind is because, blown. Because Curtis didn't want you to know. <laughs> when something yeah. goes wrong, I, like nothing happened. I fix it or we fix it. And just keep moving. And where did those 1,500 scarves disappear to? Uh, They stayed in my condo for a year until the team did the, uh, the, like, bring a scarf, get the Boxing Day scarf. And they sent somebody to my condo to pick them all up. I was like, free donation. Take them. (laughs) I've had it. You know what? That, that's incredible. Kind of makes me wonder what else has gone wrong and has been very well covered up. Um, if you all have a dead body out there that, that you need, like, taken care of tonight, curse your man. Um, Am I? Am I? hide it in this condo. Yo, if you can hide 1,500 scarves, I'm pretty sure you can find one space for one dead body. Wait, 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 no, no, no. Not just 1,500 scarves, but 1,500 scarves in a condo. In a condo. Wow. Color me impressed. Um, I think my maybe my favorite scarf is probably going to be the or the first time we did Bless Your Heart. Yeah. The that was Bless the Your scarf Heart. that started it all for me. That's it. That I that was I, I saw that scarf and I was like, oh man, that's yeah. just that's just peak. I need that. Yeah. I need that. Curtis but, is pointing to his. Yeah. 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 But yeah. I, I will say I think up. my favorite scarf, my my favorite scarf in my entire collection. Ooh, there's two. There's two I really love. But the the, the one I would like where in my grave is the original Vamos, Vamos, Vamos. I think that was- Which if October. Curtis buries you, he will never find you in your grave. No, clearly. no, no, no. But this is the this is the black and pink and yellow Sugar Skull one. The okay. first time oh, they did like, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if anybody out there, know, you, you all know me, okay. I have a minor obsession with art from Day of the Dead. And yeah, they did that scarf and I ran down there and got three of them had to Incredible. have them hold it because they sold out like this. And yeah, love that scarf. That's my favorite. Anybody listening, if you find yourself in a Goodwill one day, perusing around and uh, you look at a green tag and you see a footle scarf, <laughs> please buy it immediately and let us know. Um, Send it to P.O. Box 70395. <laughs> mm. Uh, moving on from, from scarves, uh, we, what do you got next? You want to go into, well, so, uh, hey, now, now that we can now like, we know that. what a supporter is and yeah, we, we know what one is. Recognize can, one when I we can, see them on the You street. could pick one out of a lineup. What on earth do these weirdo supporter people do in a match? Like, what is it that they bring to the table? Chanting. Chanting. What is chanting? What is, what is this chanting thing that you speak? Are we like invoking spirits? Are we... Um, like Gregorian monks or something like that. I I don't know. Yes, yeah, so break it down for me. Moves, volume five. Doesn't have a Gregorian <laughs> chant. <laughs> Let me tell you, if it wasn't for the chanting and and the spirit along with that, and bringing it in from the supporter section to the rest of the stadium, um, I think it it also helps at, at least at the bends, mm. um, incorporating the players into what what's going on and how they feel supported as well. Saying you think the players need to hear us. You think the players need to hear oh, yeah. that like we're all behind them and we're pushing them forward. Yeah, I think they get fired up. They they, you know, um it's like our last our last home game that we had when um somebody missed missed a goal. Oh, that was beautiful when Silva missed yeah. 
And then, and then Gigi went up to him and, and was like, you know, encouraging the fans, come on, give him a cheer. Let's, you know, encourage him because it, it, you know, let's keep going. Yeah. It's monumentally important. I think, I wonder what, as a professional athlete, which clearly I am not, I just live vicariously through other people, <laughs> what that feels like, the difference in the, that kind of organized support via kind of just making noise, like at an NFL game, you're usually not seeing that. You get a little bit of it in basketball, six man with the Hawks and so on and so forth. But I wonder if that that feels different in terms of energy received via chance or via kind of just, whoa, you know, just making noise. How that feels for the players on on their respective fields. It's got to be weird, right? Because you, as a professional, train yourself to tune noise out to not hear the person trying to distract you, but you do want to let in the good noise. Do you have to learn what the good noise sounds like and the bad noise and tune your ears to that? Do you hear it all and just ignore part of it? How does that process work when you are not just playing at a standstill or when something's happened, but in the run of play, do you hear that? And you're like, Oh yeah, I feel that I can run a little bit faster. I'm going to make this pass a little bit better. Or is it just like, it's like you said, is it all just sort of like a background murmur at that point? Or you're just Mm. hearing like the blood pumping through your ears. Mm. And I remember somewhere that they stated that it, that the Benz was one of the stadiums that visiting teams hated to go to because of the noise. Do you guys think that because of that, because of the chanting and the noise and and what you said with the tuning out and everything, that that's why there is such a disparity between home and away records in MLS? Oh, absolutely. I think that more than any other league, home away matters more in MLS for that reason. But I also think that the third party in all of it is, I think the pro refs, are a little gun shy of being true neutral at someone's home. I think they tend to err towards the home team on some calls. Uh, not for us, <laughs> but, <laughs> but for 23 other teams, 25 other teams, they do. Totally. And they just kind of go, I mean, I've seen it so many times in so many stadiums where it gets loud and it's great. And, you can see the refs behave differently when you see Atlanta United play at home versus playing on the road somewhere. Hmm. Interesting. No, I mean, I, I, I completely, I completely vibe with that. And I mean, I know Pineda has even mentioned like, what is it going to take? You know, what is it going to take for us to get treated or Atlanta United to get treated with some level of equity? I think it also depends on the ref personally. Sure. There, there are some, yeah. definitely, there are definitely some Not refs that sure. are tend to be more biased in my opinion. Well, where did all this, where did all this start? So interestingly, interestingly enough, um, you know, a lot of T so, so the first football chant and a lot of this information I'm going to uh, throw toward a gentleman named Andrew Lawn, who has actually written an entire book on the subject. Now uh, there was not budget for this episode for me to go out and buy the book on Amazon. So sorry, Andrew Lawn. Uh, I just, you know, kind of stole your answer from the guardian. Um, but Hey, if you're really interested in this stuff, I would definitely recommend going to check out his book because the little uh, segue I read was actually quite fascinating. Uh, and, and what's really interesting is just how many different famous composers and musicians have actually written chants for soccer. Like, I think it's pretty cool. Like, it's almost like a Eurovision song contest kind of thing. Um, so that's pretty neat. Uh-huh. The um, the uh, the first football chant that is still actively in use today is called On Chelsea. the Ball. Chelsea. No, Chelsea. No, it is not Chelsea. No. Okay. It is not Chelsea. It is chant in the history of chants. You get no honors here because Chelsea wasn't even mentioned. Yeah, no, no, I'm just kidding. We're terrible. Go on. Yeah, no, but uh, it's called, uh, It's it's from Norwich City. Uh, and it's called On the Ball City, and it was written in the late 1890s, uh, which actually even predates the club, the club itself. Hmm. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was wow. actually composed for a dinner celebrating the achievement of Norwich's many football clubs. And then when those clubs merged to form Norwich City, uh, and some guy named Albert uh. T. Smith came on as a director, he brought the song with him, and the fans started singing the song on the terraces, and that be- 
began the whole tradition of singing all these songs. Okay. Um, and that actually led to a bunch of provincial and parochial songs uh, celebrating places that they came from, like Blade and Races, Play Up Pompey, and several other things. Uh, mm. The first chant that was actually written for a side, uh, yeah. interestingly enough, was written by the uh, classical composer, Sir Edward Elgar, for the Wolverhampton Wanderers. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was uh, for uh, some player named Billy Malpass. And apologies to all you Wolves supporters out there. I have no idea who these people are. <laughs> um, and it is called "He Banged the Leather for the Goal," which uh, <laughs> I feel like sounds very elegant and posh. Uh, you know, like some sort of classical composer would write it. And I happen to actually really like Elgar's music. The little he bit of banged it. the leather for the goal. If Bang the this is a the this is a working class sport, if ever there was a chance to prove that, he banged <laughs> the leather for the goal is it. So the whole chanting thing changes a lot in the fifties because you've got the world, you know, you've got England's entrance into the World Cup in nineteen fifty, like you talked about, which grew the game on a global scale. But you had a bunch of England supporters who traveled to South America for the fifty World Cup in Brazil, and that's where they encountered a lot of the supporter culture that had grown up in South America. And so that's where you start seeing things like the Ole 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 chant and Dele Cavese and a lot of the stuff that's pretty recognizable in terms of what you see at Atlanta United matches invading European soccer. That's where they picked it up from. And then with the, you know, with, you know, pop music and more teenagers uh, becoming sports fans and getting into uh, sporting events and things like that, you had a lot of. Um, you had a lot of teams start picking up popular music and porting that over to matches. So like, that's where you get stuff like you'll never walk alone for Liverpool or I'm forever blowing bubbles for West Ham. You know, that all obviously, you know, is not old music. It's not centuries old or anything like that. So it's, it's an interesting mix of keeping old traditions, but, you know, allowing clubs to grow and embrace new and popular stuff. Like that's the thing. It's, it's, an, it's always changing and evolving based on, pretty much what the teenagers like. Cool. Yeah. Gotcha. I'm looking forward to uh, the, the TikTok chants that will soon be <laughs> invading everywhere. Apart from chanting, what is, uh, what is another thing that uh, supporters are, are prone to do? Tifos. 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 Adam, Jennifer. what do you know about Tifo? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I know it derived, I think from an Italian word. Yes, yes, it did. Bingo. So, yeah, and um, it it's just phenomenal getting involved with all the SGs and and putting together the TIFOs. It just that's how I got to meet a lot of the people that I've met over the years. Is when they've had the everybody come in and say, "Hey, we we're doing a TIFO. We need help painting, drawing, sketching, whatever." Um, and then just to see the final product is really a lot of fun. Jennifer, regale us with a little bit of history of of the TIFO. What a TIFO is for those that maybe do not do not know what uh, what TIFO is. So a TIFO is a choreographed, and I think the emphasis on the word choreographed mm. fan display. So it can really be anything. It can be a giant. 200 by 200 foot banner it can be multiple banners it can be one piece of artwork it can be what we like to call a card stunt where you put out you know different color foil or plastic pieces or flags and you wave them in a certain way and they make a pattern or something like that it can be a coordinated flash mob dance the whole point is it is planned it is practiced and it is put up at the beginning of the match to show the team you know to, to, to hopefully infuse some energy into the team and get them riding banging for leather on goal <laughs> um yeah sorry that was really bad you know, feel free to roll your eyes at me because i dropped a glenn in there um love it <laughs> but yeah so the, i think that's the cool thing is that tifo can really be anything that's coordinated and i think that's the the, you know, what, what you said, Abby, like the fun part about it is it, you, it takes teamwork. There is no one person that can actually make or build or create a TIFO. It takes a lot of people to make a TIFO go. And it's from, from the ground, you know, from the, from the ground up. Um, and the TIFO actually, you know, in terms of soccer history is a relatively new phenomenon. 
uh, didn't really get started until the late 60s. It did come out of Italy, which is where the the, the terminology is from. Um, and, you know, frankly, it's not really a huge thing in England. It's a bigger thing here in the United States, like in and also in uh, and in Germany. Um, but for the most part, like the more artistically driven TIFOs tend to come from Eastern Central Europe uh, and the United States. Um, the United States, you know, obviously the Sounders, uh, Portland mm-hmm. rivalry and, and you know, the folks over at, uh, at Timbers Army and the folks at Emerald City, they put on some phenomenal TIFOs. But like great work. It's, it's, but it's interesting because as more teams are coming into the league, there's just been more onus and emphasis on these displays that are literally up for about three minutes. And so we're seeing some really creative uh, and, and interesting, you know, signage and usage of the form. And I, I love it because I love the art. I like the message. Like, I think it's a very cool and unique thing that um, doesn't necessarily translate so well to other sports. It really is one of the things like you could wear a scarf at any sporting match. Right. I don't know that TIFO culture really fits anything else other than soccer. So, yeah, I, I think that's pretty cool. And echoing what Abby hmm. said, like being involved in TIFO, like it's been an awesome way to just meet. That was the first thing I ever did was I showed up for a TIFO build. I was like, okay, I'm going to go, you know, paint Tata throwing balls of fire at people. Sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like a lot of work to make all that happen, to make it all look and sound cool, all the vibes. Um, how on earth? does one or ones and all these people like begin to wrangle all that. This, this doesn't just happen out of the blue. It it does take a ton of work, uh, unpaid work, by the way, y'all, um, to, to yes, we are all volunteers. It's unpaid, but it's not free. (laughs) Correct. So we, let's introduce this, this concept, the Gulch concept in, in general, why we need it and um, how how it works. Who wants to take the lead on that? How did it come about, Curtis or, or, or Abby? Feel free. I know other teams out there have have similar things. Thirty two fifty two in L A. So, backline um, in Nashville. Backline in Nashville. So on and so forth. How did this idea come about, and why do you all think it was? And I think it was needed, but for you, why was it and just kind of the genesis of it? So believe it or not, we've been working on this since 2016. Uh, mm. It has taken this long to get done uh, for reasons. And I think if I can get into some like background, which is why shows why it's necessary, is that Atlanta did not have a pre-existing NASL team that was coming to MLS. It was an all new enterprise. So you had a lot of different, you had a few groups, one group splits into two, splits into three, and then four. And now we have six groups that sort of show up and everyone is trying to make their mark on the culture. And no one is wrong in what they're doing, but you're seeing a lot of duplication of efforts. You're seeing a lot of staking out of ground and territory through ethos. Not that, you know, anyone's breaking new ground, but people are saying, this is who we are. We want all these people. And another group's going, this is who we are. We want all those people. And it led to like a weird sort of weird wizarding world of Harry Potter sort of uh, (laughs) drama and intrigue. Who is Hufflepuff in this scenario? (laughs) Don't remind me. And, and, And it led to a lot of, you know, bad and hurt feelings on all sides. And I even have to take some responsibility for that as someone who was around then and probably should have done more than I was doing to make to get us to this point. Sure, we're all working on this, but then come Saturday or Friday night, we're all like sort of uneasy. And through the work of a lot of other people other than me, because I was gone when this gets across the finish line, I'd moved to Minnesota. A lot of people did a lot of work. Leanne at Resurgence, Casey at Resurgence, Abby and Mark at The Faction, uh, Lisa and Amy, Terry with Footy Mob. So many people did so much work to get this across the finish line. And I just showed up on the last day and went, hey, can I put my name on the group project? (laughs) And they were like, sure, go ahead. But Yeah, so it does. It takes an army. And so we we had representatives from all six groups 
in forming the Gulch. So you had um, from Terminus Legion, you had Lisa and Amy, myself and Mark from Faction. You had um, Curtis and Terry from Footy Mob, from Resurgence. Uh, Casey was involved, but you ended up with um, Blair and Leanne from Resurgence. From All Stripes, it was um, Norbert and Ryan. And then from Ladose, it was Diana and Gabby. So that was the core of people that really worked on getting this going. And and what we all realized, even bef- like in the early days, was, hey, if one of us is buying paint, we're not going to use all of it for a TIFO or for banners. If we have some left over, hey, you can use it. And those little acts of sharing sort of built into like the greater trust that we probably should have had from day one. And the Gulch has given us that opportunity to have that unified voice on the things that we share. The Gulch isn't meant to replace any SG by any stretch of the imagination. It's more of a framework for the SGs to combine resources where necessary and possible. Uh, you aren't going to see like a Gulch SG. No SG is going to go away and sublimate itself to the Gulch. It's more like, when we need to collectively bargain, the Gulch can do that on behalf of the uh, SG. Yeah. And I, then, I like the way you put yeah. that, that collective bargaining, being a union guy yeah. um, and being part of, of a union and having um, a, a sort of unified voice. It, it must be, I would imagine, um, an, a, a more effective way of communicating. In, in our case, with film and TV, we'd be communicating with our employer. You, we, in this case, we're communicating with the front office instead of having six or more different voices, sometimes repeating what the other person already said or in conflict or whatever. Now you can have sort of a, a unified voice to to speak with um, Garth and, and everybody else up there about our needs and um, for, for yeah, travel, yeah. for TIFO, whatever. Yeah, and it's made things so much more easier for those reasons because now you don't have, for instance, three or four travel people in the room unless we need three or four travel people in the room. We can bring one person and they spread the information out. It gets where it needs to go. And look at Jennifer raising her hand as the person who gets me everywhere I need to go. Uh, I'm going, Jennifer, I need to go to Trader Joe's after this. Can you help me out? (laughs) Texting your Uber right now. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, But it helps to be able to minimize the number of contact points for information, which means everyone gets better information. It means we're all getting the same information at the same time and no one's being left out because one person didn't check their email. It's, hey, it's hitting everybody together. It's no more telephone. It saves us money in that we can collectively buy TIFO materials. Uh, The pit has been up and running independent of the Gulch before us, and they are sort of showing everyone how this group can come together they can start running the drums and everything and have that. They've got everything together. Travel has got everything together. Now the rest of the culture is sort of catching up to those two areas in communication and policies, procedures, and just making sure that everyone who is a supporter can have a great game day, whether it's in Atlanta or not. But mm. then for the coach period, we really want to show to the rest of the people in the stadium who have either a unfortunately bad uh, affiliation with the supporters groups or they're ambivalent or don't know we exist that this is what we are, who we are. This is what we do. If you like TIFO, we're the ones who make it. It's us three or four nights a week, taking time off, like carrying gigantic TIFOs in the back of very small cars, getting things to and fro under restrictions that, most people would go, what? No, I'm not doing that. But we make it happen because of our love for the team and for the sport and for the city. It's not about, you know, our egos as in we did that. It's more about like, hey, we did this thing. It'd be great if you came along with us. Like our supporter section, like 3252 is the number of seats in that stadium. Our supporter section is probably around 5,000 seats. And it's because it's massive. I mean, if in my perfect world, Everybody in that stadium, in Mercedes-Benz, is in a supporters group, and everyone knows all the chants, and it's literally a place that no one wants to come in wearing any other color other than red and black. Like, you should be 
slightly terrified of playing in that stadium because your ears will be ringing for the week afterwards. Like that's what I want that stadium to feel like. And I hope that the GOAT can preach that to the people who wrote the SGs off or Mm. seem to care or are just so far removed physically from the supporter section that they just see the flags waving. They hear some noise coming, but they don't really get interested in what's going on and how it works. That's primarily why we're, we're doing this is to shine a spotlight on that and break down maybe some of those barriers or some people have some hesitancies about, you know, do I fit in this thing? Do I have to be this fanatic about soccer? Do I need to know stats? And like, no, nah, man, we're, we're just here to create an awesome, inclusive, fun, loving environment that's also terrifying for people to come in. We can provide that in a way that, you know, you you just can't get and probably are never going to get with with other sports. Terrifying in the haunted in the house possible. sense of the word where like you're paying money to go get the, yes. your pants scared off of you because it's really fun. Right. Not terrifying because well, it's you know, personally intimidating or terrifying because people are scary or things are whatever, but you know, that kind of like fun experience where, you know, you're paying money to terrify people. And I, I still want to be a great host before the games, come to the tailgate, hang out, have a great time after the game, have another beer for you. But for that 90 minutes, I want you to experience like the most enjoyable hell you've ever experienced in your life of like, sure. I don't want to be part of this again, but I kind of want to do it next season. When's our next trip to Atlanta? Hmm. I love that. I, I and the other that. thing I was going to say yeah. is yeah. that's why we have, we have six different, there's six different SGs that are totally different, but we all come together. I mean, we all, so people say, oh, I, I, you know, I don't belong. Look at each different SG and what it represents. And, and that's the way that you can become involved. So what draws, SG. what draws each of you to to having been a, a supporter, what what do you what draws you the most to being a supporter of of this team, or what did draw you? What still draws you? I became um, now I'm a member of a few different groups, but I'm on leadership at Faction, and Faction it tends to be known as the family oriented um, supporter group. So we got very involved with our kids, um, a lot of coaches. So having been in that realm as a mom, that was where I felt comfortable uh, initially. So for you, it was more like just like a, a family, a family thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, cool. So basically cool. you missed being a soccer mom with a tumbler full of Bloody Mary <laughs> and you wanted some other soccer moms to hang out with. Got it. <laughs> I was a soccer mom. My son played since he was two. But I also played in high school and college and before they had intercollegiate women's soccer. Hmm. So I was the precursor to what they have now for women's soccer. Mm. Mr. Jenkins, not Jones. Uh, <laughs> what do you, what do you, what drew you in? For, it could have I been mean, just to Atlanta or earlier days or what is it? What's the juice for you? I mean, as the consummate lifelong Atlanta fan, and hearing the amount of disrespect towards Atlanta fan culture from Major League Baseball, the NBA, the NFL, sometimes for, you know, good reasons, but mostly just to, like, we seem to be the whipping boy of everybody. Oh, they don't show up on time. They blah, blah, blah. This is why nobody, soccer will never work in Atlanta. Hockey will never work in Atlanta. All those things, like, I felt, I knew that this, city this community cared about sports and soccer in particular like it was in anyone who lived here could see it and i really wanted to be a part of helping that community like say we're here we're loud and you can't write us off and i think that's what drew me in was that civic pride in wanting to get Mm. all the people who were wronged by atlanta spirit group or (laughs) you know Tim McCarver or like anybody and to say like, no, we're going to take this thing and we're going to make it bigger than you could have imagined. And we're going to be annoying about it. We're going to be in your face. We're going to be like, every time we show up somewhere, we're like, 
hey, remember when you wrote this, Jeremiah O'Shan? Remember that article about how Cypher wouldn't work in Atlanta? Like, I still remember reading that to this day. And he's walked it back and said, I was wrong. But there's so many people on Reddit, on Twitter, who were in 2014 when the team was announced, like, ah, no, that's not going to work. Wait, can't wait for them to be relocated. And now look at us. We annoy everyone. And it makes my heart grow three times every time I read a hateful comment online. I'd run through a brick wall for you, man. I love it. Jennifer, what do you what what drew you in first? Uh well, I was one of those people that was horribly burned by the Atlanta Sucks group. And uh <laughs> I uh fuck you, Gary Bettman. Fuck you. Um, but no, for real, I, I like didn't really have a sport because Gary Bettman stole my sport. I grew up in an ice rink. Um and uh yeah, I so so in 2014 there was like this huge like big deal Costa Rica making this Cinderella run to uh, the World Cup quarters, and uh, it shut my working world down every time they were playing. It was nuts. Uh, I went to Midway, and I watched some World Cup soccer. That was pretty cool. And then, oh, hey, find out we're getting a team. And um, yeah, so th this is the weirdest thing, right? Like, I went to my first match at Bobby Dodd was, you know, in, in the tailgate in the varsity, and I got... I'm going to air quote heat stroke. I got heat stroke in the varsity parking lot. Um, and a whole bunch of random people. I don't know. I don't know who they are to this day. They <laughs> sat me down under a tree. They put cold compresses on me. They somehow or another got me into a stadium where I see these people standing and trying not to fall off bleachers and like, what the heck is this? And the bless your heart scarves. And I'm like, this is insanity. I love this. I need to be around this some more. And yeah, so that, that it was just like, I didn't know what, what the culture was like. And then when I went down there and like, I was immersed in it for like four or five hours, I just get in my veins. It was awesome. Yeah. And it was really, you know, a lot of what Curtis said, it was like, a, you know, you want to talk about my city where I'm from? Uh-uh. Fuck you. you know, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not here for that. I'm, I'm going to show you what Atlanta is all about and I'm going to be a part of Love that. It. And we're going to make this, that town that everybody wants to be at but everybody hates us because we are that town. <laughs> Mine was slightly less uh, spiteful and, and not coming and rebelling against that energy. Mine was, it's pretty simple community friends and just having people to, to, to hang with um, it, with football and, and, and outside of. Um, and I, I found a, I found a group that, that welcomed me and it was, it was just love and, and fun. And I, I don't know if Curtis remembers this, but I think it was at, the uh, at Midway Pub for our second match, I believe, uh, the Blizzard uh, in Minnesota, where we put uh, six or seven past Minnesota after they politely warmed up the pitch for us. Thanks, y'all. Um, <laughs> and I was watching at Midway, and uh, yeah, I had just joined Ferdinand Mope, and Curtis came up and was just struck up conversation. It was just, it was just cool, man. Like. It, it, it was fun to to find people that that liked something that I that I liked, and, and there were no barriers. There was, do, do you know this about that? Or there was no gates. There was no gatekeepers. It was just, man, I love this, and I want to share this with you, and I want to create memories with you, and hang out and have fun. And I'm like, I'm all I'm all about that. And I, I'm in, you know, a bunch of different groups. There's not like any one group, and like ev there's just, you know, yeah different groups do do some different things you know it just depends on like what kind of you know social outlet you're looking for that day you know i feel like being artistic cool okay resurgence is doing the tifo this week i'm gonna go help them paint or hey um you know i got nothing to do this weekend but you know factions out here you know cleaning up clarkston uh for soccer in the street so i'm you know let me go get my hands dirty or you know footy mobs out there signing people up to vote okay cool it's october let me go sign some people up to vote um mm, yeah. I mean, just, there's always something going on inside all of the supporter groups that is about making the city better. That's ultimately, I think, the thing that I love about being here. And I really think everybody that I know, including both you and you and you, Abby and Curtis, it's yeah. what you guys all feel too. It is about yeah. making Atlanta a better place to be for everybody. We're so rowdy and we're proud, but it's all about the city. Yes. Yeah. And the I mean, team. I think it's funny that people assume that the first job of any supporters group is the team. The first job of any supporters group is the community. And yes. you are like what we have is six communities that are part of one larger community that is still part of yet even a larger community. 
And without mm-hmm. the people, it's just like, I was terrified for months and years of standing in that parking lot alone at the varsity and no one showing up. And it just be me and Stefan like, hey guys, want some music? And luckily it, it, it worked and you build a community, but then you have responsibility to that community. And I think that's where we are now is we now all fully understand our responsibility to, to the community of the city and of the sport through our actions and how those things that we did in 2016, 2017, 2018 affect us in 2023. So now hopefully our actions in 2023, 2024 set us up for a sustained supporter success that can withstand when the team isn't as great. If they're hopefully knock on wood is not another pandemic, but if so, how do you maintain the community that you built regardless of the the team's performance or what may be happening otherwise. So let's talk a little bit about that just going forward in, into 2024, because I, I and I think, I'm, well, you know what? I don't think I'm not going to go with any assumptions. I'm not sure if people understand, like you said, the first thing that many people think of, it's about the team. No, nah, it's about the community. So what are some things going forward into 2024 in this off season and silly season starting up? What are some things that y'all got going on over over the off season when it comes to the community aspect, other volunteer outreach? Like you said, we've done things like voting drives, get out the vote, community cleanups, um, food drives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. What's some things that are that are coming up? One of the things I think is coming up, we've done it in the past, I think we're waiting on some confirmation from the front office, is we've gone out and um, for those less fortunate, we've gone out and a bunch of people in the morning will go to Walmart and go shopping for gifts for the holiday. And then they would bring it all back to one central spot. And then we would wrap those gifts for those families. Um, and they would, you know, be put with a Christmas tree and the whole thing. And there's this whole celebration. And actually some of the players come and help uh, as well as wrapping mm, gifts, which is pretty lovely. fun to see. <laughs> it's, it's pretty fun to see Brad Guzan wrapping presents. Um, but that's, you know, that, I know that's, that's usually one of the things, many things coming up. I just, I he's just, big. That he's called, he's at the shopping mall, Brad Guzan, Brad Guzan. <laughs> he is, um. Man, he's such a good dude, uh, being involved with, with that stuff. And it's this is such a great way of, like, you do this community stuff, but you get to connect on this level with these players, these professional athletes who we, uh, you know, sometimes idolize and, and put on these pedestals. And then you get to get up with them on that level, helping your community that, you know, they've just brought in. And and it's it's such a unique thing to to this game that you just – don't get anywhere else. And it's such a cool thing to be a part of. So what do you got? So in term more, more in a bigger picture type of thing, like looking ahead toward 2024 and uh, building on the fabulous uh, TIFO that we had at our fabulous last home match. Cause we're just going to forget that the one on Sunday didn't happen. And we're just going to like live in uh, you know, the Tuesday home match. How, how, how are we rising from the ashes in 2024? What do you guys see? Where do you guys see the gulch going? What do you what are you guys hoping that we get to do with that this coming season? Right now, I mean, to be completely honest, and I think it's the right answer, it's the right thing. It's a lot of conversation of what do we want this community to look like? We have the gulch now. We know what function it serves, but what does that look like on a practical level? What do we want supporters culture in Atlanta to look like? We all say inclusive. But what does that look like on a game day level, whether it's at your watch party or in the stadium? We all love to say we're diverse and inclusive, but what does that mean? We all want to say we're oriented toward these communities, but how are we actually serving them? And I think that's what we're doing now is finding out that, you know, there are going to be at minimum six different answers and there should be. But it's how can we take those six different answers of, this is what the faction sees the community being. This is what Footy Bob sees. This is what Ladose and down the line see. And how can we get all of those things pulling in one direction? And it's like, we got you over here. You help us over there so that the community keeps moving itself forward 
for supporting the team, but also supporting the community and making a self-sustaining uh, entry, not entry, uh, machine where people can join in, help. And when their time is done and they're like, hey, I'd like to just go back to being a regular member, they can, but they can still stay engaged. Or when somebody goes, wow, that TIFO is pretty cool. I'd love to help out with that. But, you know, I have a hard time being on my knees to paint. We got you covered. We got something else you can do. And that's what we want it to be is a long off season. Oh, well, it's going to be short of conversations of what is necessary for this to go from what we've had, which has been great. And then moving it forward to the point where it's literally a model for other people to say, oh, wait, our SGs don't have to all do the same thing, but they can pull the same direction. Cool. Oh, wait, we don't have to be contentious with the front office as long as it's a respectful conversation and we can have our bright red lines of do not cross, but where things can overlap and work together, they, they can. Great. I think so many times in sports and in life, you tend to look at the team as this giant multi-billion dollar inter enterprise, which it is, but it's still made up of people. And I mean, if we're being honest, there are people in our stands who make more than some of the players on the team. Absolutely. And I think we tend to lose sight of that in that you're dealing with people sometimes, not in Atlanta, but just, you know, culture at large. Mm -hmm. And sure. yeah. that in order for us to be what we want to be, in order to show what we want to show the world, it takes us sort of banding together to do this. And I think we understand that now we just kind of want to get the other, you know, 35,000 people in the stadium to, to ride along with us. Abby, any, any final thoughts off, off of that heading into 2024 and what your, what your kind of expectations are, what your, what your thoughts are leading into this thing and where we go from here with the Gulch. This is really a year of collaboration. Um, we really have worked hard to get to where we are right now. And now it's finalizing the product and moving it forth and really working together and hearing everybody out. Um, and I, I think, I, I think it's moving in the right direction. You know, we're, we're still in the early stages and sure. there will be bumps along the way. But I think we're on the right track to have one of the best, if not the best in MLS supporter group culture. So with that being said, if people have questions or if they want to share some feedback or if they want to get involved, how do they get a hold of the Gulch? That's a great question. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> we're working on it. <laughs> Nothing but great questions from Jennifer. <laughs> That we are still honestly working on. Uh, I mean, one of the weirdest things about the Gulch is it was finalized, everything signed off in the middle of the season. So we're still doing things as we're trying to set up a thing. So this coming off season, but there is an Instagram, there is a Twitter handle. Tweet at those things, Instagram, pop in our comments and go, hey, what can I do? What do, what do you want to know? Like anything, we are an open book. Like communication has traditionally been what supporters groups in Atlanta have not been great about. We're going to over communicate. We're going to like give you an answer. We're going to show up with coffee the next morning with a donut and go, hey, did you understand that? Do you need anything else explained? And then we're going to give you a ride to work and then give you even more detail. Mm. And then guess who's coming to Christmas morning, baby? Curtis. He's popping up with even more answers. So questions that you might have had, but you didn't ask because you thought it was too soon to ask them. Jolly Jenkins, let's go. Coming down the chimney, stuffing your socks with more more soccer answers. <laughs> I love it. I do um, love French toast for breakfast on Christmas morning if you're, if you're interested. And, and we'll put those handles in in the show notes. But what what do what are you at on uh, on the on the Instagram and, and the other socials for for the Gulch? Is it just the Gulch? So for the Instagram, it is at ATL underscore Gulch, and we're all tagged there. You'll see all the pictures of all the things for a while, mm -hmm. uh, and then on the Twitter or X, whatever we're calling it now. Yeah, the uh, two hundred and fifty six character app. What do we got? Yeah, it's at ATL underscore Gulch as well. Okay, cool. 
And we'll put those uh, in the show notes as well. Coming to other platforms as soon as someone has the bandwidth to do it. If, if you needed a reminder that this is all done uh, by volunteers and people, yep. you know, a lot of people, and, 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 and look, no one's saying, hey, you got to give up all your free time. But like the more people that can give up, you know, maybe an hour here, or a couple hours on a Saturday or whatever. But, you know, like, we, we, should, we, should re- we should rephrase that. I'm going to rephrase you. You're usually very good at the phrases. You're very eloquently spoken. I'm going to rephrase the give up. Invest. It's investing an hour. It's investing your time and your energy. And I promise you, y'all, um, as being a part of, of this for since the inception, your ROI, your return on investment is far greater than, than anything you can, you can anticipate. Uh, it's definitely you get more than six percent. It is definitely more than six percent. Um, Where, where's, where's the camera, Glenn? Let me look into the camera now and, okay. and address the audience, <laughs> <laughs> friends, listeners. The best thing you can do is to come to an event that NESG is doing, any or all. Go to multiple and meet people and talk to them. We need so many things that we don't know that we need because it's all volunteer and people are giving up hours of their time at best. And they're giving up. This is going to sound weird, but they're giving up 150 percent of their effort for the one percent of their time they have available. And people are doing so much. And a lot of times you'll see comments of like, why didn't they just do this? We didn't know. We would love to have even if it's not your hands painting or waving a flag, if you have knowledge that can help, if you have information that help, if you happen to own a large warehouse that's suitable for painting a 200 by 250 foot, <laughs> we're especially talking to you. But not everything is physical. A lot of it is, you know, having those people that have the knowledge that can help move an organization forward. You can be an accountant and be the most important member of an SG somewhere in this world. You know, there's so many places where people can get in and bring their weird talent that they thought nobody cares about this. Yes, we do. We will take it all. If you make origami and you're the best origami maker on earth, talk to your boy. There's always something that we need that we may not know that we need. And we don't want a preconceived notion to be a barrier to anyone joining any group. So whatever your skill base, whatever your knowledge base, whatever your availability, if it's a half hour, three days a week, guess what? That's 90 more minutes than we had the day before. And we'll be internally thankful for it. I love it. I've met, and, and you meet friends for life. Y'all have this commonality of this wonderful sport that either you grew up with or have learned to love because it just started in Atlanta and never knew about soccer before. Um, but you've made, I've made friends for life from being involved in the SGs. It's true. It's, 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 it's brought me so much joy and just fulfillment in, in, in my personal life. Like I said, that return on investment It's better than any other investment I've got going on. Uh, I promise you. Don't play the stock market, y'all. Just get in a supporters group. I promise you, you'll be you'll be better off. um, You'll be much richer. That's for sure. You'll be much richer. Invest in scarves. The scarf market is set to go off like a rocket. Look (laughs) out for footle. Find it, y'all. That return will be incredible. All right. Um, Thank you guys so much for for joining this. Um, I. Jennifer and I had full intentions of this being like a, like a little quick little 30 minute thing. And it's over an hour and it doesn't feel like it. This was such a good conversation and an important one. And I hope people listening to this take a lot away from it. And I think the primary thing I hope people take away is that this is about, about, about supporting your community. It's about supporting each other and doing something good for for yourself for everyone this is nothing but but love and positivity and um creating a um an, an amazingly terrifying in a good way environment like curtis said the end game of this is to have the whole stadium be a supporter section 
70,000 of us in one unified voice chanting, making this, you know, a truly intimidating place to come play. Unlike anything that this league and maybe in around the world has seen like that kind of noise, you know, that could really, that could be something. And I think we're on our way. I'm really excited about this gulch that, that's happening. I think it's needed and I think it's got a ton of potential going forward. I can't wait to see what's going to happen. Um, next week, we're going to, in the weeks uh, coming, we're going to be featuring all the supporters groups uh, two at a time two by two um so we'll have three more episodes coming out featuring each of the groups so you can all can get to know them and what they're about and see which one you kind of vibe with um and what you might like to come be a part of and then i think throughout 2024 season when we inevitably win mls cup we'll be checking in what you nod your heads absolutely um it's going to be a tremendous off season we're we're gonna we're gonna do this thing um we're gonna check in with everybody uh, periodically throughout the season, little um, spring check in, probably you know around around June and international window, or right when Copa is happening in Atlanta. Let's go, um, and then end of the season and just kind of seeing where things go. And and I'm really really excited for what this thing could could be and just the potential it has to bring more people into the fold. Man, this is cool. And, so, and hey, y'all, if there's yeah. anything at all that you want to know, questions you want us to ask, yes. you know, drop them in our drop them in our socials, you know, just, you know, like I said, this is this is a whole open forum discussion. We're we're fans yeah. just like y'all. We are not masquerading as anything else. We are just here for we're here for having a good time and we're here to give you our takes on things. So, you know, if there's stuff you want us to talk about, let us know. We want to hear from you guys. Yep, it's just a conversation. So drop them in the comments or send us an email if you like to go the old school way. Five takes on the five stripes at gmail.com. All right, y'all. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, everybody here, for participating in this. We will be back next week with a new five aside. <laughs>